Awesome. Uh, thank you for allowing me to introduce our next speaker, uh, Peter Smybert, who is currently the Vice President of Functional Genomics at Immuni, has helped develop several technologies for multimodal single cell analysis. In his previous role at the New York Genome Center, he led the Technology Innovation Lab, where he and his collaborators developed SightSeq. This high throughput single cell analysis technology uses DNA barcoded antibodies to quantify cell surface proteins of interest and single cell RNA sequencing to quantify RNA, allowing you to quantify specific cell surface proteins and RNA in single cells. Because single cell RNA sequencing workflows are well established in many labs, it was fairly accessible to many first time users. Furthermore, this technology was developed to enable single cell CRISPR screens with ExciteSeq on top of what was already offered with the previous application. In addition, Peter helped develop ASAPSeq, a technology capable of simultaneously collecting information about chromatin accessibility, the abundance of hundreds of cell surface, cell surface and intracellular proteins, and mitochondrial DNA variants for thousands of single cells. Let's welcome Peter for his presentation on his work and the many ways he has found to combine many single cell assays into, into multimodal measurements. Peter. Thank you, Luke. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. Thank you, Nikolai, again, for the invitation to come and, come and speak today. Um, I'm gonna to describe work all that was done during my time at the New York Genome Center. Um, so hence the New York Genome Center background. I, I've recently moved to, to Immuni, a biotech company located here in New York. Um, okay, so I'm gonna mention development of a bunch of different multimodal tools for single cell genomics um, and how we've applied them to functional genomics. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so in a highlight of uh, single cell multiomic methods, which I think Nature Methods referred to as the method of the year in 2019, Michael Eisenstein referred to RNA mm -hmm. as sort of the, common, the common currency of multiomics. It's the easy to capture uh, molecule. Uh, it's got a nice poly A tail that's universal that you can pull on and grab every RNA species essentially. Um, and because it's relatively easy to capture, it's referred to as the common currency of multiomics. And there's a whole suite of different single cell multiomic methods that have been built around RNA. So RNA plus something else. And this is sort of attempting to, to, to summarize some of that here on this slide. Um, but I think as this audience will appreciate, uh, there's some limitations to RNA. Um, I, I think in general, anytime you want to measure anything from a vanishingly small sample, the amount of the starting material is crucial to how, how sensitive your measurements can be. And I think this is nicely highlighted if you just look across the central dogma of gene regulation, where there's this natural amplification from DNA to RNA to proteins. And indeed it's, it's estimated that there's on, order, on the order of two to three logs difference in terms of individual molecules for comparing individual RNAs to their, to their cognate uh, proteins. So, what this means with respect to uh, single cell analysis is, is that if you're working with sparse data, you, you tend to have relatively poor separation of cell types. But if you have relatively high coverage data, uh, as long as you can make enough measurements, you can you can generally get pretty sensitive uh, measurements and and more um, better discrimination of, of different cell types. So, oops, sorry, lost the slide. So I think. I realize I'm sort of among friends here and normally this is a harder sell, but I think I could say to this crowd that proteins are useful things to measure. Um, and this was the motivation behind developing SightSeq and, and ExciteSeq, which is sort of a, a cousin method. Uh, the basic premise of this is that if we could measure these highly expressed proteins, which are often uh, definitive of a final cell state or a, or, or a, or a cellular behavior, um, and have also been very well studied and have nice reagents um, to detect them, um, we can use that and, and use that to complement the, the more sparse uh, methods such as RNA-seq. So the way that SightSeq worked is to integrate an antibody binding to a protein into, into a sequenceable event. And the way we did this was to attach an oligonucleotide to an antibody. Um, and it had this general overall structure where there's a, an amplification handle that's compatible with, with sequencing. Uh, there's an antibody barcode, uh, which, which labels the identity of the particular antibody that the oligo was, was attached to. And then there's a capture sequence. And depending on the, depending on the, the, the type of assay that you're doing, the, the capture sequence can vary 
Uh, we started out with poly-A tails to be compatible with three prime RNA sequencing, have made versions that are compatible with 10X Genomics's uh, five prime or VDJ kit. Um, and there's a bunch of other sequences available. 10X themselves now have this feature barcoding method that they refer to as that has a proprietary sequence that you can attach to. And there's even, um, uh, there's a separate set that uh, of oligonucleotides that, that are compatible with Mission Bio's um, single cell uh, genome sequencing um, uh, solution. The important points to make here is that the barcode space is essentially infinite. So you can design as many barcodes as you like, um, and you're, you're very unlikely to ever exceed the number of antibodies available. So functionally, it's, it's infinite. Um, and because you're sequencing these in, in sequence space, you don't need to worry about things like fluorophores overlapping um, and you know, competing with signal. So in theory, you can measure as many things as you want simultaneously. So just give an overview of how this method actually works. So the way that we do site seek sort of a beginning uh, is to label cells with these, with these antibodies, wash to remove unbound. It's very important, this, this washing step, otherwise there's a lot of background. Um, then you encapsulate the cells in your favorite single cell method of choice. I'm showing a droplet uh, based method here, which is where we've done most of our work in DropSeq and in 10X Genomics platform. Um, this also works in plates, micro wells, um, uh, other droplet based methods that, such as DDSeq from BioRad, for instance. Um, once the cells are in the droplet, depending on how the method works, but in, in this case, let's say the, the, the cells are liased in the droplet, the mRNA content associates with the, with the oligos derived from the barcoded microparticle, uh, together with the oligos that, that, um, that derive from the antibodies, they hybridize, there's an extension reaction, and then you marry essentially the, the cell barcode to the barcode, uh, or either the mRNAs from the, from the cell or the, or the barcode that tells you which antibody was bound. Um, and conveniently, you can size separate the products that the antibody derived tags are small and the cellular derived cDNAs are typically much larger. So a, a typical size separation um, uh, step, which you would normally do just a, just a spry purification, uh, the, the, the fraction that you would normally throw out if you were just doing RNA sequencing, you actually keep um, and is able to um, uh, contain all the antibody based information. So this is old data. This is, this is our first site seek on human blood where we just looked at T cells, B cells, monocytes, macrophages, et cetera, um, and designed a very simple panel that was going to paint this, uh, this, uh, this population of cells nicely. And indeed, this is the case. You can see uh, in green, uh, sorry, in blue is the is mRNA for, for the genes defined above. And in green below is, is the protein expression. And you can see it, it, it at least cluster level uh, they agree very nicely, um, although it's very clear that you actually get much better resolution with the protein, much better to signal, signal to noise, um, and just in general, higher sensitivity. So the initial work was antibodies that we made ourselves. It was a fair bit of work to conjugate them, to purify, to make sure that they were of sufficient quality. Um, Biolegend uh, worked together with, with the New York Genome Center to commercialize this. Um, and they've really taken, taken this by storm. They've, there's over a thousand catalog products now that they have, which is a, a huge number of their antibodies conjugated to specific oligonucleotides. And working with them, we were able to get early access to essentially the kitchen sink, the kitchen sink of all the different antibodies that they had uh, and could profile these on, on, on a bunch of different tissues. And shown here is, is uh, almost 90,000 PBMCs from humans uh, stained with 220 antibodies. And what I want you to get out of this, uh, this illustration is that we can cluster the cells based on their RNA expression on the left-hand side, uh, on their protein expression in the middle, or by this joint representation. And th this is work that was uh, computationally that was led by Yuhan Hao, who's a, who was a grad student in Rawls Teachers Group, and on the wet lab side by Stephanie Hao, who's a, who's a technician in my group. Um, and if I switch to the next slide you, slide, you can see that with the joint representation, we have really uh, quite striking detail. Now, th these plots themselves, so this doesn't mean anything without any context. 
if we manually circle uh, these clusters and describe essentially what they are, by layering the protein information on top of the, of the RNA and clustering based on the joint information and using this, this weighted nearest neighbor approach, which essentially um, for each individual cell decides is, is there more discriminating power based on the RNA or based on the protein and then weigh, weighs, uh, weighs how much of each is used accordingly for each individual cell. So by doing this, we can uh, really subdivide some of these cell types that are otherwise quite hard to tell apart. Um, T cells uh, are notoriously difficult with RNA-seq because they're quite small, they have small amounts of RNA, and they tend to express relatively high levels of RNases, which uh, affects the quality of single cell RNA that you get from them. So uh, it's, it's nice to show a pretty view map, but it's, it's also nice to show that, that you actually can find some interesting biology by this. Um, and I think this is a nice example here where, and we, we still don't really know what these cells are, but there's, but there's a population of cells here, which are labeled by the red boxes on the, on the left hand uh, plot, showing that in the joint representation, but not in the RNA or the protein representation in the middle or on the right, um, these clusters really light up the CD49 protein. And so th these are all the same cells in each representation, but it's only when we cluster jointly with protein and RNA together that we can actually see these clusters discriminating and, and showing that they you know, strongly enrich the CD49 protein. Um, so uh, we expanded the SiteSeq method uh, in something that we call expanded CRISPR compatible SiteSeq uh, or XSiteSeq. Um, I, I, should, I should mention, by the way, that I should have mentioned this earlier, the, the SiteSeq work initially was led by Marlon Stokius, who was a wonderful colleague and, and senior scientist in my group who's since gone on to bigger and brighter things at, at 10X Genomics in Stockholm. Um, for for ExciteSeq, uh, this work was led by Eleni Mimitu, uh, who's actually also joined Immuni, uh, and Stephanie Howe was involved in this as well. Um, and in this case, this is making protein detection compatible with 10X Genomics' five prime kit. Um, and I mentioned briefly in the introduction, so I won't go into the details as to how that works, but the 10X five prime kit enables you to study not just gene expression, but also to recover chronotypes of immune cells. So the TCR alpha and beta chains, we could hack it to get the gamma delta chains and, and the B cell receptor heavy and light chains for, for immunoglobulins uh, are all recoverable. Um, we've also changed, altered this method a little bit in order to, to use oligo-labeled MHC tetramers to, to decode TCR specificity uh, together with Nick Skarakis' group at formerly at UCSC, but, but currently at, um, at UPenn. Um, but uh, the final thing, and I think the thing that sets this method apart is we recognize that um, because of the way that this kit works, you can spike in a custom primer to get a non polyadenylated transcript. Um, and a really obvious candidate for this was the sgRNAs that, that people use for CRISPR perturbations, which are variable at the five prime end, but have a constant three prime scaffold. And so by spiking in this primer that's specific to the scaffold, we could capture sgRNAs directly from their, from their pole, uh, pole three transcript um, and, uh, and, and be able to use these for CRISPR screens where you can directly detect the, the, the RNA of interest. So this is just a, a quick flavor of some of the data that comes out of ExciteSeq. Um, on the left-hand side is showing how you can use this with respect to recovering chronotypes and proteins at the same time. So this is a, this is a sample, well, a two samples, a control sample, pardon me, and a cutaneous uh, T-cell lymphoma sample. Uh, we can look at cells that are producing uh, functional, uh, they have a functional CDR3 region, so that are expressing a T-cell receptor. And then we can break the cells out by their clonality. And if you look at the, there's clearly an overexpanded clone for a cutane, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. This is the transformed cell that's massively expanded. And we can essentially use in silico flow cytometry to sort CD4, CD3 positive cells in the bottom left um, and look at differential gene expression analyses. And you can see that there's a gene expression signature that is the polyclonal cells from the CTCL patient look just like the control CD4 T cells, but the, the transformed cells, the, 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 the monoclonal cells are have, have an extremely different um, gene expression signature. 
On the right is an example of how we've used this for, for CRISPR screens. Uh, in this case, cells are clustered in the top representation by uh, the guide RNAs that they express. And you can see uh, both at the mRNA and at the protein level that uh, in some cases to varying degrees, the down, down regulation of the cognate transcript has been targeted by the guide RNA. Um, we, we think this is really important because protein detection is as for, for reasons we've gone into at the start is, is a really robust readout. And this is especially important for, for CRISPR screens. And I, I think this plot on the left here shows this quite nicely that for this one particular protein and, and mRNA, um, cells here are ordered by the level of expression of the guide. So those that essentially up to about 300 cell number um, have high, high levels of expression of the guide. And you can see at the mRNA level, to some degree, but at the protein level to, to an extreme degree that the, the downregulation of, of the particular um, modality that's being measured. Another way of looking at this is thinking about how many different cells you would need to look at in order to get a statistically significant view of, of whether a cell has been perturbed. Um, and I think it's really clear that uh, for three different guides against the same gene here, CD, CD46, um, at the mRNA level, you really need a good number of cells, at least 100, well, at least 50 for the most effective guide, and not even 100 at, at the, at, for the two less effective guides is enough to give you a statistically different, uh, statistically significant difference, uh, differential gene expression for this particular target uh, for this number of cells. However, as we downsample the cells and measure protein, even the less effective guides, we can see this, um, this, uh, this phenotype extremely readily. And so we think this is extremely powerful for, um, for single cell based CRISPR screens going forward. This is just an example looking at one gene at a time, but uh, F.E. Papalexi in, in Rahul's lab and together with, together with my former lab, worked together, with, uh, worked together to do a CRISPR screen looking for new regulators of pd one in, uh, in as an immune, immune checkpoint molecule. Um, and by we're able to find some new methods, uh, mechanisms of, of pd one regulation using this, using this screening. So the main part of the talk, I want to mention new methods. So this is, this is work that's just been published uh, early this year. Um, we're again, centering on protein uh, as, as, as a really important modality to measure. Um, we've, uh, moved away from RNA, at least initially, um, with the idea that we can uh, use protein to, to supplement measures of chromatin accessibility. So just a really brief introduction into a taxic. So this is a, this is a measure for chromatin accessibility that's referred to as the assay of transposase accessible chromatin by sequencing. The way this assay works is essentially uh, open chromatin is accessible to a TN5 transposase. It's loaded with sequencing adapters. So you incubate your intact nuclei with TN5 transposase or intact but permeabilized nuclei, and the, um, it will insert its sequencing adapters wherever it can, but it's not very good at inserting these adapters where, where chromatin's all wound up. And this is a, this is a rich but sparse data set, data type. You, you can end up with, uh, sort of highlighted down below here, you can see these nucleosome free fragments that, that you can detect. You also get mono or dinucleosome fragments that, that span one or more nucleosomes. And you can also get some more sort of subtle information like uh, footprints of transcription factors, the areas essentially that were protected from transposition because there was a, because there was a, a, a transcription factor sitting on them. Um, and ATAC-seq itself has become a single cell assay in the last few years by a variety of different methods, combinatorial indexing, microfluidics, use of nanowells, and more recently, and with increasing popularity, uh, droplet-based methods, um, mm. including by, uh, put out commercially by BioRad and by Phoenix Genomics. Um, and to be really frankly honest, almost embarrassingly so, we had a bit of a mental block with ATAC-seq. We were, we'd, we'd, we'd long thought, wow, this would be great if we could combine protein detection with ATAC-seq. But our mental block was around the fact that this was an assay that people typically did on nuclei. And we knew that if you, if you denuded cells of their, of their uh, cell membrane, you lost a lot of the really informative uh, cell surface markers. 
so we played around with this for a while and we had some promising results, but we, we, we kind of thought it might be, might be of limited utility to combine protein detection with this. Um, and really it was truly a failure of imagination. It was when we saw this lovely talk by Caleb Leroux and uh, who'd worked together with Life Ludwig to develop this method called MTSC attack seek. Um, these guys were interested in uh, looking at the clonal relationships between cells in a population. And they realized looking using existing attack seek data that they could, that they could do this by uh, reconstructing the mitochondrial genome from, from the attack seek data. But they found that it, it was it was okay, but they would have they actually wanted more mitochondrial, uh, a larger component, larger proportion of mitochondrial reads, and they recognised that if they fixed and permeabilized whole cells, they could actually retain just a you know a Goldilocks sweet spot number of, of mitochondrial reads. And so they did a bunch of optimization, got this working beautifully, published a lovely paper about it. Um, but as soon as we saw this, we recognised, oh, we've been thinking about this wrongly the whole time. We can fix and we can stain the cells with our antibodies then essentially perform MTSC attack seek. Um, and then we can get the surface proteins together with all the features that they've already nicely profiled. So this is where ASAP seek was born or attack with select antigen profiling by sequencing. Um, so we, we started this collaboration with these guys immediately. And uh, the first thing we did was we wanted to see whether this was feasible. Um, if we stain cells with antibodies and then perform a, 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 what was MTSC attack seek, do we still have the same detection, the, the same ability to detect cell surface marker, markers? Uh, pleasingly, the answer was yes. We really saw very little diminution of signal by, by going through all the different steps of the MTSC attack seek um, method as measured by flow cytometry. Um, the other thing that was kind of stopping us to some extent was, as I mentioned, BioLegend has taken the ball and run with this and made you know, thousands of different catalog items. It's a real pain to conjugate oligos to antibodies, especially if you're not really hardcore biochemists like we, like we are not. Um, and so we were motivated to try and find a way of doing this that didn't involve making a whole new set of conjugates. Um, and fortunately, the way that ATAXIC works, there's a linear amplification step within the droplets where there's at least, in 10X at least, there's 12 cycles of linear amplification. So we recognized that, that we could uh, throw in a bridging oligo. And so this is sort of schematized here in the middle where it's blocked at the three prime ends. So with itself can't extend, but it can serve as a template where the antibody bound oligo will anneal to it. And then during these amplification cycles will be extended, putting a, a new extension on the end of the oligo that makes it then compatible with the oligos that are derived from the 10X genomics product. In subsequent rounds of, so this is what it looks like after extension. And then in subsequent rounds of linear amplification, uh, the, 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 the products are merged together and you can create this tag library that can be sequenced together with your, with your um, attack seek library. So this is, I'm gonna skip a little bit here in the interest of time, but uh, it, sort of the verification experiments to the point that it, it does work. Um, this is a, using a TBNK panel. This is just a very, it's just a simple nine uh, marker panel from, from BioLegend that highlights all the major cell types within human blood. And I hope you can see if you look at the top row by protein expression here, all these markers are uh, prominent in the cells in which they're expected to be expressed. And if you compare that to the, to the bottom row, which is the gene activity as measured by a tax seek for those particular genes, for the most part, this, this matches up um, and it matches up in ways you'd expect it to. And it even diverges in ways that, that you're not, not surprised to see it diverging. So with this, we're, we're confident that the method was robustly detecting proteins. Um, uh, one feature that was sort of a, a nice bonus, um, whenever, I, whenever I presented SiteSeq in the past, the first question I always got was, that's great, but does it work for intracellular proteins? And I don't want to um, spoil the surprise, but I can see that Hattie Chung is speaking uh, a bit later on this afternoon, so she, she might have some updates on this. Um, at, at any rate, with respect to ASAPSeq, we knew we had whole cells that were fixing and permeabilizing enough to get transposase in. So we reasoned that there was probably a pretty good chance we could, we could use oligo-labeled antibodies to, to get at uh, uh, intracellular targets as well. Um, there's some details I can go through later if there are questions, but about different species of oligos, et cetera. Um, but long story short is that uh, this worked pretty well. Uh, the top row here on the right-hand side is showing surface markers, CD4, CD8, and I think CD56. Uh, 
skewered by my Zoom screen. Um, and on the intracellular, uh, ZAP70, Granzyme B and perforin uh, all show ex expected patterns of expression within the, the, the T, T cell and NK cell clusters. So, and, and we've since extended this to other intracellular targets and it really does work quite nicely. Uh, as a next step, we, we took this into a developmental system. Um, the, the advantage here is that, that you can make use of these mitochondrial DNA mutations to trace the clonal relationships between cells. Um, and so we, we went into human bone marrow. Um, when we did this, we recovered 21 different clusters as measured by chromatin, uh, all the different cell types you'd expect to see. And again, uh, the protein expression uh, was where you, would, where you would expect protein expression to be for, for the vast majority of markers tested. Uh, Importantly, we could also use the mitochondrial, well, re recover the mitochondrial fragments and use these to infer clonal relationships between cells. We can see such things as, as the, uh, this, uh, the, the variant marked in, in purple here is depleted in the, in the, in the, in the progenitor lineages. Uh, I can't see my cursor, unfortunately, but it's uh, sort of in the middle of the, of the cluster on the left-hand side. And if we look, uh, if we do a, a, a pseudo time, uh, trajectory of differentiation, monocyte differentiation from progenitors all the way to mature monocytes. Um, we can look at protein expression along this trajectory. And this is looking at 61 of the, so only a quarter of the markers. And you can see that there's all these wonderful uh, patterns of expression in a developmental system um, for markers that you may never have looked at but you can assay them. The, the beauty of this approach is that you can assay them all at once and look for novel markers of, of, of different cellular processes. Uh, finally for ASAP seq, actually not finally, but one of the, an, another thing we want, another direction we wanted to take this, and this is, this is where we worked really closely with Kelvin Chen from um, uh, Shimon Sakaguchi's lab in Osaka, um, was to use ASAP seq uh, as a model system for, for looking at perturbations. Uh, in this case, we're not detecting the guide RNAs themselves directly. We're using, we're using hashing. This is a, a sort of a sister method to SiteSeq where we label samples with an antibody that, that binds a highly expressed epitope on the surface of every cell, but we're effectively multiplexing samples by SiteSeq. Um, and the idea here is that we label each individual perturbation by a hash and then do a perturbation by RNP um, uh, electroabrasion. Then we can stain, uh, so we pull the cells together, stain them for cell surface phenotype markers, run ASAP seq, demultiplex cells based on their hashtag counts, um, and look at the immune phenotype. Um, and just as an example here, if we cluster by, by chromatin accessibility, um, I hope you can see that the cells that are marked by hashtag three and hashtag four, these are cells that either have uh, guides uh, targeted against CD3 or, or against ZAP70. So these are TCR signaling, you know, important canonical markers, uh, canonical genes involved in TCR signaling. And they cluster completely differently than, than the rest of the, the, the perturbed cells and they cluster together. And we can look, if you look on the bottom right hand side, you can look at these in terms of uh, perturbation score essentially, either at the level of chromatin accessibility on the y-axis or at the level of uh, protein expression on the x-axis. And you can see different, uh, different genes clustered together and behaving similarly or, in, or in, in some ways more strongly with, with chromatin accessibility in some ways more strongly with protein. Um, we, we recognize that we could use this together with SiteSeq on the same sample. This is one of the advantages of having the, the proteins, uh, sorry, the antibody reagents being identical. Um, and so what this meant is that uh, we could stain the same cells with the same sets of antibodies and very late in the process, take another quad of cells, split them out, fix one and perform ASAP seq, and with the other one perform site seq. Um, and when we do this, we can uh, look at basic QC metrics. We do get better tag libraries from site seq than we do with ASAP seq. We believe this is partly because of the, the, the permeabilization step washes away some of the membrane, but nevertheless, if we look at SiteSeq or ASAP-Seq, uh, SiteSeq here on the y-axis, ASAP-Seq on the, on the x-axis, 
that we, we believe the protein detection is equivalent biologically in the sense that you can see the same trends, you see the same genes, up, same proteins upregulated, the same proteins downregulated, and the correlations is very nice between the two measurement uh, methods. Um, and what this enables us to do is to do an integrated analysis at the DNA, RNA, and protein level, where we can look, say, uh, you know, the white axis at the, pro the proteins, x-axis RNA, or in the color axis at chromatin accessibility, and see for each individual gene how that gene is affected by, this, in this case, the stimulation um, the process. And on the right-hand side, if you really want to, you can, you can now go down to the individual gene at the individual cell level uh, and sort of do a feature plot and see when genes are up, when genes are down, et cetera. So we, we, we like to think of these as companion assays, ASAP-seq and SiteSeq, that are suitable for downstream integration. Um, and this was all wonderful and nice. Um, and then 10X Genomics released their multi ohm kit, um, which essentially took the integration part of this and made it irrelevant because now the, the multi ohm kit uh, can measure attack seq and RNA seq from the same single cells at the same time. Um, and so we quickly adapted that uh, protein detection to this as well. This was actually a much easier uh, step to do because the method of protein capture is exactly the same as site seq. Uh, and with the lessons that we've learned from the, the, all the tricks for cell prep and permeabilization, et cetera, uh, we were able to essentially on the first attempt to get this method what, that we call dogma seek to work. Um, it's called dogma seek because it, because it spans the central dogma of gene regulation. Um, we really tried hard to fit an acronym. We couldn't do it. And Eleni, being the genius that she is, came up with uh, an acronym that I think is way better than anything else we could have come up with. Um, and this is similar to ASAP seq. This this works. You can tune the amount of mitochondrial RNA that you that you capture or discard. Uh, sorry, mitochondrial DNA. So you can also use this for lineage tracing if, if you choose to. Um, uh, below, I'm mentioning a couple of different ways, and, and I'll mention. I'll also mention again later. There's a very similar method from the folks at the Allen Institute for Immunology uh, over in Seattle that they refer to as T seq. And the two methods are, are very similar. I, I encourage people to compare and contrast and, and see what see what looks easiest. But um, the, these methods produce really high quality libraries, both at gene expression on the left-hand side here, um, ATAC-seq, uh, either measured by counts per cell or by uh, TSS enrichment, and also protein tag uh, complexity on the right-hand side. Um, and we we worked again together with Yuhan, who, who we'd previously worked with on the, on the um, the large, uh, large site seek work, uh, adapting his new uh, weighted nearest neighbor method. So rather than adapting two different methods, uh, two different modalities together, this is now integrating three different modalities together for clustering. And again, now in a truly unified assay, you can measure chromatin, RNA, and protein uh, simultaneously. And I think I like this last slide because it, it points out that this is just showing the modality weight. So the, the weight that was given to each individual modality for each cell within this within this um, plot, and I, I like this because it shows that, that depending on the cell, some cells are more discerned by their by their chromatin accessibility, some by RNA, and some by surface protein. Um, and indeed, there's a little highlighted protein here that's almost entirely driven by uh, the plus that's almost entirely driven by its protein weight. So to summarize, um, these are two new methods that that. Uh, pair protein detection with, with a tac seq uh, with or without RNA-seq, um, and enable capturing of mitochondrial DNA for, for clonal tracing. Um, I want to point out some other methods that have come out at the same time that are really worth a look, and there's, there's, some, there's some wonderful work that's being done around this space at the moment. Uh, this work by phage, phage attack by Evgeny Fiskin from the Viva Gev's lab using phage display, essentially, and then recovering the phage sequence to also detect proteins. Uh, I already mentioned T-seq, which is a very similar method to, to, to Dogma-seq, um, and Neat-seq, which is a, this is a preprint that just came out a couple of weeks ago, um, that actually seems to have made a really cool little trick. So again, it's a very similar method to Dogma-seq. It uses a 10x multi ohm kit, but these guys have focused on uh, nuclear proteins, transcription factors, and they use a really nice trick to, to essentially block the non-specific binding of oligotagged antibodies by conjugating with a single strand of DNA binding protein. Um, and it, 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 it looks really nice. Um, and one of the things that I'm interested in going forward, especially in my new role at Immuni, is to, is to, uh, is to pair these types of approaches 
uh, with CRISPR screens for, for large scale functional genomics. And we can see that, there, again, another method that I, from Will Greenlee said, spear attack um, is a way of capturing guys directly in an attack seek experiment. And I think that will be extremely compatible with ASAP seek. And of course, the very classic crop seek method um, that people have been using for years now should be completely compatible with, with dogma seek. Um, so with that, I just want to thank the people who've done the work. Uh, I mentioned Marlon a little late, but I, I mentioned him. Um, <laughs> uh, so he, he initiated SightSeq and, and worked a lot on cell hashing. Eleni led the work on ExciteSeq, ASAP and DogmaSeq. Steph was uh, instrumental in the very large scale um, uh, SightSeq work, which was a really tight collaboration with Yuhan Hao from, from Rahul's group. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but Effie, I, I did mention Effie has uh, extended ExciteSeq to really sort of more biologically relevant screens beyond the proof of principle. I'd encourage you to check out her recent paper. It's, it's really lovely. Um, and on ASAP-seq and DogmaSeq, it was a really wonderful collaboration with Caleb Life and, and Kelvin, especially uh, from, from these labs that you've all heard of. Um, and I want to thank funding, Chan Zuckerberg and NIH. Uh, BioLegend has been a wonderful partner uh, for the last four or five years in, in developing and enhancing these methods. Um, we still maintain SightSeq even in our spare time. Um, please feel free to ask questions if anything is not clear. We try and update protocols, et cetera. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and look forward to taking any questions. Awesome, thank you, Peter. Really appreciate uh, the presentation you gave and the detail amongst all the methods. Um, so we have a few questions here um, in the chat. Uh, so uh, Fatima asks, uh, what is the current stage of these affinity-based techniques for intracellular proteo measurement uh, regarding the throughput and multiplicity of the methods? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question and I'll have a go at answering it, but I think I also save this for Hattie who's, who's speaking a bit later on this afternoon. Um, she's, she's got a lovely method called InsightSeq, which is essentially looking at intracellular proteins in InsightSeq. There's this, this significant challenges, um, especially when you're trying to measure RNA. RNA is, as you know, very labile. It can float in and out of cells. So the very fact of permeabilizing a cell in order to assess its intracellular protein, proteome necessitates some sort of a fixation or, or a, a DIG permeabilization. Um, so there's, there's challenges with signal to noise and getting antibodies to bind nicely, but not just bind, but also to be able to wash off non-specific binding. Um, there's also just not the same level of, um, there's not the same number of reagents that, that there are for cell surface proteins. So um, I, I don't know that anyone's really yet knows how far you can push it with intracellular proteins. Um, and I guess the other point that I'd like to mention that the, the neat seek paper that I referred to goes a fair way towards addressing is that these, you, know, you think about an antibody and you, you draw it with an oligo sticking off the side, but in reality, the, anti the oligo is, is at least as big as the antibody, if not bigger, depending on the size of it. Um, and there's generally more than one attached to an antibody. So you've, you've got this sticky charged molecule that you're trying to get through a permeabilized uh, uh, membrane, uh, make find its target, allow to bind, and then wash off if it's not what you want. Uh, in order to have appropriate signal to noise. So there's, there, there, there's some significant challenges. Um, I'm not going to pretend to have any solved. And, and I think this is why um, ASAP-seq works nicely because the chromatin in ASAP-seq is, is still locked up nice and tight in the nucleus. Um, it's not really labile. DNA is pretty stable. It's not really able to float away and, and, and you know, join the soup, leave the cell behind. Um, and, and so I, I, I feel like it's an easier nut to crack than, than, uh, than combining with RNA-seq. But uh, I mean, Hattie's done a good job doing this, but it, and she, she can, I'm sure she'll speak to this as well. Gotcha. Well, uh, thank you for the explanation. This is a little bit of a follow-up and you, you, you did mention uh, several of the challenges um, and, and uh, the follow-up would be, uh, you know, are some of the main challenges, do they, do they include restrictions on available antibodies for these uh, forms of uh, studies? Uh, yeah, I, what's available is what's available. And uh, if you're really motivated to, we've, we've done plenty of conjugations in-house and they work nicely. And we have a, 
actually, if anyone's interested, look up siteseek.com. There's a very there's a very cheap, easy way of uh, conjugating antibodies, uh, oligos to antibodies. It's a lot more affordable than some of the commercial kits that are out there. Um, and in our hands, it works really well. Um, but having said that, the quality of what we can conjugate in-house is not as good as what comes from BioLegend or any other company that has their own conjugated antibodies. So it's about motivation. If you have a particular target that you really want to look at and you want to go to the effort of conjugating and making that reagent, then, then you can. Um, but yeah, the, the vast majority of available pre-conjugated DNA, DNA barcoded antibodies are targeted against surface proteins. Great, great. Um, Herbert asks, with 200 plus antibodies in the same reaction, do you expect uh, cross-reaction any uh, issues, any of those? Uh, it's a good question. I, I mean, I, I don't know what to expect when you throw 200 of anything in a reaction. You, you, you don't know necessarily what to expect. I guess all I can say is that for the most part, the, 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 the staining patterns that we see, so if you refer to a staining pattern on a UMAP, I'm a reformed developmental biologist, so I still think that this is a pattern. Um, uh, they make sense uh, biologically. Uh, there's, as with any of this, there's, there's obviously, uh, there's noise, there's, there's filtering steps, there's, there's background subtraction, et cetera. So it's not, you're not necessarily looking at raw, raw counts all the time, um, but we haven't really seen what looks like sort of specific non-specificity, if that makes any sense. Sometimes you see a bit of noise, but the signal is generally above that, but we don't, we haven't really seen evidence of, of cross-reactivity where something is you know, binding precisely where it shouldn't. Um, I'm sure that will happen though, but uh, yeah, for the most part, it hasn't, hasn't been a major problem. Uh, gr great, thank you. Um, uh, there's a few more questions in the chat, but I'll just uh, ask the audience if there's any uh, in-person questions to be asked right now. Well, one of the follow-ups um, is uh, from Chris Jackson, is how difficult is it to control or normalize for cell size? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's not something we've ever really spent a lot of time worrying about. Um, in general, within most human cells that we work on fit nicely into a 10X genomics droplet. Um, so that's not typically an issue. We certainly have seen, and others have reported. I think the uh, so there's a bunch of different multiplexing papers that have that have come out we, after we published cell hashing. There's other methods for for essentially labeling all cells of a sample, lipid based oligo, lipid conjugated oligos, or uh, actual click chemistry to to attach oligos to fixed cells. And so we we saw this with hashing, and these some of these methods have also reported it where. Um, the amount of hashtags that you get on a particular cell can be a proxy for how large that cell is. It totally makes sense. If there's more surface area and more proteins on, on the cell surface, then, then you do get a larger number of uh, counts. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't typically do it. I mean, I think that, I think that there will be, uh, in, in the data, there will be a readout that can probably uh, report on cell size. Um, we typically don't do any kind of normalization. Though. Great, thank you. Thank you for your insight into that. Um, so the last question would be, uh, if possible, please compare genomic-based and MS-based techniques in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Um, also <laughs> requesting some ideas from Professor Slavov on this input as well from you, Peter. Oh boy. Um, I don't know, Nikolai, do you wanna have a go? <laughs> Well, that, that, that question is worth a long discussion, not a short answer, but uh, uh, one of the big differences is that with RNA sequencing, DNA sequencing methods, detection is much better. You detect um, at least one copy from many more genes, while with mass spectrometry, we tend to detect more copies per gene from fewer genes, at least at the moment. Uh, and that question also depends on the specific assay and how that's being performed. Uh, one comparison that we have done, uh, you can read about in our recent genome biology paper where we perform 10X genomics and scope two analysis, mass spectrometry analysis of single cells from the same population. And we did some comparison of the analysis that one can do with the two types of data. 
Well, thank you for this question. I'm happy to continue the discussion more on that topic. It's really a, 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 lar, a long topic. And thank you so much, Peter, for an exciting uh, uh, talk and uh, answering all the questions that uh, we had for you.